I guess we're beginning week four. And um, a very disturbing headline, uh, Alaska lost another 9,000 jobs in the third quarter for the biggest decline since oil prices crashed. And I think this just punctuates our need to stick to the um, guiding principles that we established from uh, December, actually, that we have to move forward with an eye of protecting the private sector. <coughs> I'm just going to repeat that uh, there's no there's no benefit uh, to Alaskans if we wreck government uh, and and the government economy, uh, which exists. That is not our intention, but we cannot. Uh, we, uh, we can't carry out actions that are counter to the private sector. And so spending limit, reduction of the uh, spending, and some form of uh, restructuring the permanent fund are the goals of this Senate majority, and we will carry them out over the next, uh, the next few months. So. I'm not exactly sure what the future will hold as oil prices continue to re remain relatively low. I was here and some of you were when it was $9.57 per barrel. Those were scary times, but we had production through the line of about 1.2 million barrels per day, uh, that uh, 1.5 I think at the time actually. And um, our production kept us afloat, so we have to keep in mind that production is, is better than price. Price you can't control, uh, production you can to some degree. Of course, we're, we're a little bit constrained by the federal government with permitting processes and those kinds of things, but uh, we will go forward, at least in the Senate, uh, with a mind towards protecting the private sector and, of course, production probably is the thing that represents that the most right now is uh, uh, oil production. So without uh, further ado, let's go to questions if you have them. And um, no questions. Oh, Austin. Austin Baird from KTU. Uh, I guess why are we just now uh, finding out what subcommittee assignments are and what is that process uh, going to actually accomplish? What's, what's your goal with that process this year? The subcommittee process, finding it out now is about when you find it out every year. Except in a year where you have, you're in the second year where the subcommittees are already established. In the first year of a, of a legislative session, uh, this is about the time the subcommittees come out. What was the second part of your question? I guess just what, what exactly are you hoping to accomplish? Are you going to, throughout that, throughout that uh, come up with uh, series of specific cuts, or what, what are we going to see? You know, I, I honestly don't mean to speak for the co-chair of the operating budget, Lyman Hoffman. Um, he will do things, uh, you know, under his leadership in that, in that committee uh, for that specific task. But, um, you know, I think what those subcommittees will do is they'll support the goals that we've talked about. There's going to be a reduction to the budget. There's going to be some kind of uh, uh, spending limit, and there's going to be some kind of restructure of the permanent fund coming out, uh, permanent fund dividend coming out of the uh, the Senate. That's that's what the subcommittees will carry out through the process. Yeah. So, Jackie. Yeah, just to carry that on, I mean, that's, that's we're actually, you know, where that typical schedule is, but we're committed again to the last year, if you remember, we completed the budget, the earliest in state history, we're committed to driving that same type of schedule. It's imperative that we get it done, but um, if you look at the makeup this year, instead of having a couple of finance members on each team, we have a finance as the chairman of the subcommittee and then we brought in other team members to make sure that the entire majority as well as the majority is invested in those cuts. So the only thing unusual about it is again driving for that we still have an eye on a 90-day session and uh, we're going to be driving for the same schedule. We have a date that we expect the House to deliver a budget. We get it second. Um, if they're having trouble meeting that schedule we may uh, accelerate the schedule from the Senate side. The Senate's going to get its job done uh, regardless of the schedule of the House. We do anticipate to come over in time for us to wrap it up uh, in the same manner that we did last year, somewhere around 
the 15th was, was what we had last year. We're not holding fast to that specific date, 15th of March, uh, which, as Senator Chicky said, was historic as, as far as the uh, uh, getting the budget out from the Senate early. So. Becky Boer with the Associated Press. I, for maybe Senator Machiki first, um, both the House and Senate are, have committees working on the governor's motor fuel tax bill. And last year you talked about um, the idea of a trigger um, to maybe sunset that when we hit a certain price, some of those things. Do you feel that that is still necessary? And I guess secondly, one of the things last year um, when we had all the tax bills is there seemed to be a reluctance to move any one with the idea being to spread the pain around versus hit people. Um, and if there's support for a motor fuel tax, how do you sort of get around that when regular Alaskans drive, but we're not considering a mining tax or fishing tax or those sort of things? Well, of course, we're talking about bills that have been uh, introduced by the administration, so it's uh, we, we have what we have from them, but um, our focus has been reducing our spend, and we've done that since 2013, right? So the, the tough part about that is there are other options. Um, the reason for my triggers was to highlight the fact that we are reducing our spend whenever possible on, from the Senate majority standpoint. Um, if I'm going to face my constituents and say that I voted yes on applying any kind of taxation to you, I want to be able to look at them with a receipt that says that we're not using it to increase the size or cost of government. We're using it to fill a gap that today is about $3.2 billion, right? So um, when we talked about the uh, sort of more scattergun approach with taxes from over industry, um, that apparently did not work well for us last year. If you look at the amount of legislation that passed by the end of the year, including a POMV or restructuring bill. So obviously with that strategy not being successful, we have to look at others. And we'll just see what comes from the other side. And uh, I, I did support the triggers. I think it's important that our government <coughs> does not collect revenue when it's not needed. I don't know if that will be successful this year. It's a relatively small tax in comparison to all the others, and it's the only one that's a true user fee. You pay in accordance with the proportion of, of motor fuel that you use, um, and I think most folks, on, particularly on our side of the aisle, support that kind of uh, philosophy. Can I say something about the motor fuels tax? Uh, there probably needs to be a discussion outside and independent of any kind of fiscal situation we're in. Um, that tax has been the same since, again, we have varying dates on it, but it's somewhere around 1968, 1970 since that tax has been changed. It's the lowest in the nation. I don't mind having the lowest uh, in the nation, but certainly we need to update, update it from time to time. And it is a a tax that uh, it's a user fee, as Senator Machiki said. And I think there's ways that we can do it in, in, um, uh, that, that won't unduly impact one sector or the next. I mean, there's some issues around the airport fees and those kinds of things. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure those out through the committee process. It isn't our intention to pass the motor fuels tax, but as I said, it probably is something that needs to be examined regardless of the fiscal situation. Uh, Liz? Good morning. Liz Reigns with KTVA. The Senate has um, said that it wants to see uh, the spending cap reduced before looking to utilize the earnings mm -hmm. for the budget. Um, but both the governor and the House uh, majority say that they don't really see a need for that, um, a need to bind future legislatures. Mm -hmm. So um, is that still a, a must-have for the Senate? And if so, how do you convince them that it's necessary? Yeah, we've been pretty clear. Uh, spending limit is, is uh, one of our top three goals. And if you say you don't want to spend it, I'm going to say, in all honesty, uh, uh, beginning this process, not being the biggest fan of the spending limits, so I'm, I'm going to try to be gracious for those who are in the same place I was back then. Um, <coughs> the people of Alaska need some assurance that we can get some control on spending. Uh, we went from a high of, or excuse me, eight 
billion dollars in general fund, and, and, and we've said at almost every press conference, uh, we've gone from 8 to 7 to 6 to 5 to 4.3. That's, that's all good news, uh, but the fact is, is that when money was available, somewhere around 2007, uh, the old axiom was proven true, and that is if, uh, if politicians have money, they're going to spend it. And uh, spend they did between 2000 and 2013. So um, we want to have a small minute to give people who ask us some comfort that there are some controls going forward. Many of the controls that we put in place, for instance, SB 74 last year, the Medicaid reform bill, that's a control that you put in place and it uh, will deliver to you a reduced budget year after year after year after year going into the future. Um, but I don't know that people uh, follow things that closely and what they want to know is that we just have a general spending uh, control on uh, year after year. So uh, I, the, the Senate is pretty high over on that. We'll see how things uh, transpire. Uh, we're not asking for much. Uh, budget reductions, that everyone agrees that we have to have some level of budget reductions. A spending limit is something I think most people can say that's a reasonable thing to put in place. And uh, a restructuring of the permanent fund that protects, protects the dividend. Those are pretty reasonable asks. Follow up, please? Follow yeah. Up. Mm -hmm. uh, would that be a, a statutory spending cap? Or yeah, it starts, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you made the, uh, my explanation in the last press conference, but it starts with a statutory spending limit headed towards a constitutional spending limit. And the, the benefit of that is, uh, one is we couldn't impose a statutory, uh, excuse me, a constitutional spending limit for a couple of years now because it has to go to the ballot. The other thing is that as you're working the statutory bill through the process and maybe even having a year of implementation, that by the time you actually put the constitutional spending limit in place, you'll have it pretty well figured out. And we have to be careful uh, imposing a, a constitutional spending limit. There are risks involved that it doesn't work 